Good evening and welcome to the House District 43B Forum. My name is Linda McClune. I'm a member of the Roseville Area League of Women Voters and I live in Roseville. And I will be moderating this evening's uh, Meet the Candidates Forum. So on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I'd like to welcome you all tonight, those of you who braved the rain out there, um, who joined us in the live audience, as well as those viewing this forum on the City Cable TV Comcast Channel 16. And I guess it's also live on the city's web portal and live on Facebook for the first time, which is kind of very new. So the League is a nonpartisan volunteer political organization for both men and women, organized at the local, state, and national le levels to encourage informed and active participation in government. This forum is part of our ongoing voter education efforts to help voters make informed decisions at the upcoming elections. This allows you the opportunity to hear candidates face to face, as we see here beside me, discuss issues that are important to you. There is never enough time to cover all the issues in a limited time and setting such as this. So if your questions are not addressed, we encourage you to contact the candidates directly. We hope that over the course of this program, you learn about the candidates and what they hope to do if they're elected uh, uh, for uh, the House. While we never endorse a candidate, we do sh uh, the League does try to help shape important issues in the community. And if you're interested in joining the League, we would love to have you. And so all you need to do is go to www.lwvmn.org, a little advertisement for the League. Um, I'm just a volunteer, by the way. Um, the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters. And sponsorship of the forum is not an endorsement by the League for any candidate. And so the candidates who file for office and will be on the ballot were invited to join us tonight and both have graciously said yes, so welcome. Um, I would like to remind the candidates that this forum is being broadcast live and in its entirety. And so uh, again, please check the cable for reviewing times. So this, this year, the citizens of Minnesota House District 43 are electing a representative to the House uh, in Minnesota. And um, uh, I don't like that, so I'm not going to read that. So <laughs> I wrote this script, so imagine that. I don't like what I wrote. So. Okay, so again, we would ask that uh, you hold all applause until the end of the forum this evening. And the candidates, uh, we ask that you focus on the issues. Records, a candidate's record is, is okay, but no personal attacks. So allow me to introduce you to our candidates tonight for House District 43. The, there are two candidates for one position. Yes. Can you speak up? Yes. So maybe you need to turn the volume up. So uh, we have two candidates here for House District 43B. We have Rachel Buckles directly to my right and Leon Lilly. So welcome. So the order of the forum will be this. All candidates will have two minutes for an opening statement. Uh, and then we have a nice timekeeper sitting in the first row. Hi, timekeeper. And so there are, when you have 30 seconds left of, left of your speaking time, the timekeeper will hold up a yellow card that says 30 seconds. If you would like to show us that fabulous card. Then uh, you will have 30 seconds. You still have 30 seconds, so you don't need to panic. And then when you see the red stop card, you do need to conclude, which means finish the sentence, obviously, that you're talking, but don't, please don't start another one. And I will force this rule, and for some reason, they gave me a gavel, so I can really enforce it. I know. Oh my gosh. So then I will ask questions. Uh, we have a number from the audience. Um, and you have two minutes per response. And I'm just going to rotate back and forth, back and forth, um, because what else are we going to do? So, um, but you know, I could, we could start with the same person every time, but that would not be so fair. So with that, we are ready to begin our opening statements. And so we'll start with uh, Rachel Buckles. Yes, I, I suppose you could say it, but I would, I would say it. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, my name is Rachel Buckles, and um, I just want to thank the League of Women Voters uh, for hosting this forum. I know that this takes a lot of work, and so I really want to thank all the volunteers here that are dedicating their time to having this forum for us. Um, I also really want to just quick give a shout out to my husband, Matt, back there, my three children, um, Ava, Caleb, and Eve Caden, and then uh, my grandmother and my dad have also came along to watch me have my very first ever public forum. Um, I'd also really like to thank Leon for being here. Um, you know, this again, this is my first time speaking in public. You've been doing this 14 years, and so, you know, when I'm gonna start mountain climbing, why not, you know, take on that right? So, um, but that is exactly why I'm here. 
because I am one of those women that when you tell me that I can't do something, when you tell me that there is limits, my first thought is always watch me. Um, I was told that I wouldn't last the very first day of basic training for the Minnesota Army National Guard. And I served my entirety, my eight years, both in the National Guard as well as in the Army Reserves. I was told that I couldn't juggle being a team mom, working multiple jobs, and successfully go to college. Well, I completed my four-year degree, and in fact, I received or I started working in the House of Representatives in a career field that I wanted within six months of graduating. Um, I was also told that because I was having a child so young that I would be a drain on society. And I would like to say that we are in fact paying our fair share of taxes on the home that my husband and I just bought this last year. And so that two minutes went by a lot quicker than I thought it would, so I will wrap up with that. Thank you very much. And so oh, next opening statement is Leon Bowie. Thank you. You'll do a great job. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, my name is Leon Lilly, and um, I'm excited to be here uh, in the fine uh, Maplewood City Hall. We got the mayor even here today, and came out. And all of you, thank you very much for coming out on this rainy evening. And uh, especially want to thank the League of Women Voters for organizing this opportunity. And uh, you would think after being in office for a while, you might not like these things, but I, I'm actually not a duck. I I like the challenge of. Uh, of ideas so I'm hoping that we do have some differences and uh, and we can maybe hear those out tonight and uh, and our constituents can make a choice of what's what's better or what's the best opportunity or best path forward for Maplewood and North St. Paul and Oakdale and to serve in the Minnesota legislature so um, I've it's my second time meeting her and uh, I'm excited but uh, many friendly faces out in the crowd including some of my family and uh, others and uh, um, I'm not going to go through who all they are, but uh, um, you know, it's an honor to be in the legislature, and I mean that sincerely. Every day, I, I wasn't the high school king or any of those sort of things, or the smartest kid in my class. I wasn't that, uh, you know, I didn't wear the big gold lapel at graduation, but you know, I'm a bit of a fighter myself, and uh, you know, I'm kind of proud of what uh, I've been able to do for this community with working with uh, other leaders in this community, and we. Uh, we've partnered together, and I think we've been able to do some good work um, for this area, and I'm hoping to continue to do that, and that's why I'm fired up. I recently had an accident, so I have some new issues, actually, that are important to me. Uh, um, I was recently injured, and so I really have a great uh, empathy for those that are in wheelchairs and other uh, mobile challenged things. To be honest, uh, I didn't have some of that empathy that I you know, to the extent I do now. Anyways, I'm excited about the future and uh, I'm proud to serve this area and uh, it's a great area. So um, I'm ex thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So we're ready to start our questions and so we will go, we won't give Leon Lily a break and we're gonna start with the first question with you. Um, and so uh, what do you think is the most urgent problem facing the state of Minnesota? Well, you know, we left some stuff on the table last session, and uh, clearly there was um, some work that we need to do on the opioid epidemic. Um, everybody reads the news, and uh, like I said just a few seconds ago, I was recently injured, and I happened to be on some of those opiates, so you can, firsthand, I kind of knew some of the power of those drugs, and, uh, you know, I'm proud to say I'm off of them, but it, uh, they were good, and I could see where people could get in trouble. And uh, so anyways, beyond my personal experience, uh, we have a problem around the state and, uh, um, and we need to deal with it. So that's one, elder abuse in the nursing home continues to be a problem uh, right outside this door. They uh, do licensing. Uh, we have a license bureau uh, for the folks of this area that come in. We need to keep working on the Minlar's uh, uh, problems. So there's a whole breadth of issues that, uh, that we need to work on. And of course, the traditional things that we can work on as a state are, are there as well and uh, will be challenging. Um, clearly, we struggle as a state with our, uh, uh, our demographics, uh, especially in education. Our minority kids continue to just lag behind. Uh, Minnesota's uh, doing a great job, and we really, uh, you know, we have a school board member here, and they're fighting every day. And we have some, I think, five award winning schools right here in this district. And the governor came out today to Carver. Um, to a local school, how cool is that? Um, but it's 
because they're doing good work and uh, also to say thank you but it's uh, um, so the education and to to, uh, to realize we have this education gap and we need to make sure that everybody's succeeding you know why that's important because Minnesota for example Minnesota uh, has all these businesses and we need these all these workers up and thriving we need our neighbors to thrive we want everybody to succeed and so that's that's what I'm excited about and I think there's some great opportunities that are on the table yet Thank you very much. So, say a question for Rachel Buckles. What is the most urgent pro problem facing the state of Minnesota? Sure, so I do agree uh, with Leon that the opioid crisis um, is absolutely urgent and needs to be addressed, and I was very disappointing that that was vetoed. Um, that would be an example of very good bipartisan work that was completely you know, eliminated with the stroke of a pen. Um, I'd also say that tax conformity, you know, there's so many small businesses that have to keep, you know, double the books to make sure that they're doing their taxes according to Minnesota state law and according to the federal tax code. And that is extremely cumbersome and expensive for a lot of our small businesses. I'd also say too that our roads and bridges really need to be um, up to standard. And I know that here in the Metro, a lot of us suffer with rush hour. I know I do every day. I know my dad back there, um, you know, driving to Minneapolis, he deals with rush hour. And as much as we want to widen our roads, there's also roads out in rural Minnesota that are major highways for a lot of our trucking industries and they're completely demolished. You know, they've been patched over so often that it might as well just be a gravel road. Um, education is also another huge thing. Um, you know, I know your children are grown, but I have children right now in our education systems. Um, earlier I said when we were testing the microphones, my oldest son just started middle school at John Glenn, and my two other children started their first day back at Castle. And so I know firsthand that we need to make sure that resources for our struggling learners are there. We need to support our teachers. We need to let our teachers be able to teach the way that their individual classrooms need them to teach. We can't I, I really want to try to look at why do we need all this rigorous testing. I know we need to have standards, but you know, last night my nine-year-old told me that he wasn't looking forward to third grade, and I asked him why, and he said MCAs. And it's just one of those things. Like, what nine-year-old needs to be concerned about MCAs the night before school starts? And I think that speaks volumes much more than any politician could ever tell you. Thank you very much. So the next question will start start with you, Rachel Buckles. Um, and there's a couple questions, and so I'm, uh, that are this basically the same theme. So I'm going to just pick one of the, the, the uh, phrasings. So Minnesota currently has a strong state economy. So what are your priorities when we the state has a budget surplus in terms of what you're going to do with that? Sure. So for budget surpluses, um, I always like to kind of listen to what is a consensus among constituents. And so um, I'm not a legislator, but I actually do work at the House um, already for two legislators. And so I do work on constituent cases for people um, over in um, Sherburn County, as well as down in Nobles and Rock counties. And a lot of people, um, they want to see some of their taxes be cut because clearly if we're having surpluses, that means that we're taxing too much. We also want to look at um, saving money for a rainy day. Just because you have that extra money doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend it. I mean, especially with the economy, when we come into recessions, and that's just part of you know, our economy, we have rises and falls. Sometimes it's good to have that rainy day fund set aside so we don't need to be asking our taxpayers to pay in more to the state when they are already struggling with their own personal pocketbooks. Um, also, you know, if constituents um, are really wanting us to beef up security and safety within our schools, you know, that is definitely another thing that we can look at with the surplus, but the overwhelming response that I would give with surpluses is listen to what the constituents want. Thank you. And now, same question. The state has a strong economy. What are your priorities when the state does have a budget surplus? It's, it's a great question, and uh, it's uh, one as a legislator that we all have to deal with. and. Uh, um, it reminds me, I just recently saw the play Joseph at uh, St. Mark's Lutheran Church, and they, uh, the big theme and towards the end is uh, you know, uh, um, figuring out, uh, answering the dream, you know, the part where they answer the dream, and then you see you know, the prophecy of what the dream means. Well, 
the the story is there's like seven good years and then seven bad years. Well, we just happen to be in the good years right now. Well, I've served in the bad years, and uh, former uh, representative, now Mayor uh, Slavic, served in the bad years, and it's 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 tough, and uh, and it's tough for even conservatives. I'll tell you, there's there's stuff that conservatives like that you know like that you would think traditionally, and it's it's tough on everybody. So now we're in a, a time where there's about there's about six years of uh, where we had deficits. Now we're about five years into a surplus, and the forecast just came out again. There's a 350 or 325 million dollars of surplus, and that's on top of the 1.6 million dollar or billion dollar uh, surplus. So it's required by law that some of that money is put away into uh, into a reserve. And, uh, and we're gonna do that as a state. I think everybody kind of agrees on that and gets that. But then what do you do? So then that's where it gets tricky. And so uh, there's always differences of what the priorities are. And I would go back to, um, back to investing in the kids. Um, and I think that's just, I just, you know, Minnesota's been great with all these companies like I mentioned earlier. And I just think it's a sure bet. Um, to think that you're not going to pay as citizens eventually if you don't take care of kids and educate them and do a good job. Um, I hate to say it, it sounds harsh, but you're going to pay in corrections or you're going to pay in other ways. And we as a society owe that to our neighbors and to do it. And that's what makes Minnesota great. So I'm sorry. Great again. Thanks. So, uh, so we'll, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back here. I think so. Oh, that's great. So I uh, will go back to Leon Lilly, and I actually have a pile of questions all on the same topic, and uh, which happens sometimes, and I'm just going to pick this phrase because it's the shortest. <laughs> so what way can our state government help with the high costs of health care for Minnesotans? So Minnesota has uh, um, continued to offer some of the best health care in the country, and, uh, and that has been the case for years. One of our biggest state, I think it is the biggest state employer. Um, I think a lot of people want to say it's the government. It's actually the Mayo Clinic. It's actually the biggest employer in the state of Minnesota. And, uh, um, you know, I work in my other life, I work at Delta Airlines. I know people are coming in from all over the world to come to Minnesota and get health care. And uh, Minnesota does a great job. But we have, uh, we have some areas that we really need to do better. There's, uh, there's people, uh, perhaps like the working poor that uh, are still struggling and we need to make sure that they're getting the health care that they need um, because what happens is <laughs> again we all pay uh, people will show up at regions or right next door here at st. John's and they'll offer care and that'll go um, don't be fooled that'll go on your taxes and you're gonna pay so we need to I happen to be uh, for universal health care I just think it's a moral right that everybody should have health care I think it's actually very pro-business. It's very, I mean, it's something that would just level the playing field um, for everyone if they had the quality health care. Um, I was lucky enough to go to school in England for a year, and you know, people were, I don't know, they always say people are starving, and they're not, you know, they're not getting health, not starving, but they're not getting health care in England, and they're, they're on the streets and that sort of thing. But that's not the case. They have good care. But yes, if you're super wealthy, you're gonna fly, hop in a plane, and fly to Mayo. Um, you know that's not an insult to the system there. But I happen to think that it's a moral duty to to uh, take care of our neighbors that way. Thank you. And so Rachel Buckle, same question: What way can our state government help with the high cost of health care? Sure. Um, so it sounds like you and I have been fairly on the same page so far. And so when it comes to um, where you said on universal health care that it's a moral right. I don't disagree that we shouldn't have access to affordable health care. I personally just don't trust that the government is the best option that's going to deliver that because look at Minit, look at Min Myers, and now I, I just don't trust that the government will be able to deliver on something as important as that. You know, when I look at, you know, what happened with you with your accident, it worries me that that could have been placed in the hands of the government and knowing what's happened to a lot of people on Minshire, that would worry me that you would get kicked around like that, especially when you're already down and out. I just, I'm not, I don't trust the government to be the best solution to bring forth that health care. But I do agree that affordable access to health care is absolutely essential. What I would like to see happen to bring down health care costs is pharmacy benefit managers, 
first of all. Um, one of the legislators that I work for, he has MS, he is in a wheelchair, and he deals with pharmacy benefit managers that were really getting in the way between him and his medication that he needs in order to function as a legislator, and not even just as a legislator, as a person. Um, and it really, really upset me to know that you can go to your doctor, and you and your doctor can come up with a plan to help you when you're sick, and you might have medications that you take, and then a pharmacy benefit manager, somebody that you don't know, will never see their face, will never know more than you know their first name, decides if you actually can take that medicine or not, and that medicine can be life-changing for you. Um, I also think that we should, I'm not saying that we should get rid of them, but we should definitely take a look again at what mandates we're having insurance company provide for people and see is there anything that is a little redundant? Is there anything that could be done differently? And who knows, maybe it actually should be put in place the way it is right there. Um, so those are just a couple of my thoughts on healthcare. Thank you very much. So with our next question, we're back to you, Rachel Buckles. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, several questions on the same theme, and I think we all read the paper and know what's probably coming. So, you know, some we have, uh, I would guess, a rising um, difficulty in building consensus between our legislators on every level. So what steps would you take to increase consens consensus building um, if elected? Uh, so, again, I had the pleasure of working with two members that I think work pretty well bipartisanly. I know that there are many um, Democrat legislators that have reached over to a couple of my legislators to work closely with them. And I actually have a very good rapport um, with Representative Rob Eklund. Um, I'm always teasing him about bringing me back donuts from World's Best Donuts. Um, you know, and we, we see on the news so often a lot of our members grandstanding. I know if anybody was watching um, the uh, Judicial Senate hearing uh, for the Supreme Court nomination for uh, uh, Judge Kavanaugh, you know, there is a lot of tension and there's a lot of grandstanding we see on the House floor. I believe uh, your seatmate does a lot of that <laughs> on the House floor. Um, but behind closed doors, there actually is pretty good consensus and I would say that there is a lot of friendship. Um, and so, I would definitely <coughs> stay away from a lot of grandstanding, um, and I know that there is a lot more common goals between legislators than there's not, and I think that when you start to take those common goals and you build off of that, when you start to have disagreements and differences, you still have that mutual respect for each other. So when you start with a common cause and work towards a solution, sometimes your solutions might be a little bit different but ultimately you're still trying to solve the same problem. And I think when we start looking at that, instead of looking at you know, Democrat versus Republican, that's when you're gonna to start to see a lot more consensus building, and that's when you're gonna to start to see much better legislation come out of the same hall. Thank you. Leah Lilly, same question. Um, what, would, what steps would you take to increase consensus building between legislators if elected? Well, I don't know. <laughs> You're running, you work there, and uh, former representative of Slava can probably say if it's true or not, but uh, I'm actually, I think I do a pretty good job of that. Um, I try to work well with both sides of the aisle, and uh, I'm, you know, I always kind of joke about it, but I, you know, I try not to get up on the floor, and I call it to punch somebody in the nose. You know, it's, uh, you know, you can fight with somebody. Um, I don't think you met my seat man. I think my I don't think Representative Fisher is the one you're talking well, about. Yeah, I think you met the maybe a representative from Rochester. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we'll go with that. But uh, I think Peter does a nice job okay. with that as well, and a true gentleman. Yes. Um, but uh, I uh, I you know one thing that was kind of neat uh, with this recent accident is that uh, you know all the members really were truly generous, both sides of the aisle. It was really a a healthy moment and. My wife and I were over at Regions, and I was getting ready for her to go to the Capitol. And the nurse is like, "Where are you going?" I go, "I'm going to work." And they go, "No, you're not." So then she, she, so I said, "No, I'm going to work." So anyways, uh, uh, Representative Fabian happened to be there, who's a representative. Honestly, he, you could drive to Chicago. Uh, it takes him that long to get up. He lives up in Thiefer Falls, and uh, and he wheeled me. He wheeled me into because I had promised a chair, a Republican chair that I was coming to the meeting, the capital investment. He called me on the phone and said, Leon, I want you to come. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I came and, uh, but no, I really try to work well. The speaker and I uh, get along um, uh, quite well. 
And again, I think it's, and yes, we have differences and uh, you know, like you had different opinions on the, the healthcare and uh, these are passionate, uh, you know, felt ideas, but uh, um, ultimately I think we can work together and, you know, we'll keep an eye on the prize, which is a better Minnesota. Thank you. If I can say no, no, we, okay, we're, we're at by our rules. We are doing uh, rebuttals. So. Oh no, it was a comment yeah, to yeah, say. No, it, yeah, so we can wait till the end. So the next question is for Leon Lilly, um, and uh, I have several questions again on the same the, the same general theme. Uh, we know Minnesota's infrastructure takes a beating every winter after winter after winter, and so. Uh, I could phrase this a lot of different ways, but I guess I'll just phrase it in the simplest way. One of the people in the audience phrased it, what are your priorities for maintaining and improving the, the state infrastructure? It's a very important question. It's one that's, you know, it doesn't uh, get all the glamor. And yes, in the spring, we all notice it as we, uh, you know, you hit those potholes and jar you or uh, you pay for the, the repair in your car or whatnot, but it's uh, it's very real in Minnesota, and uh, uh, and Rachel mentioned in greater Minnesota with the farming and moving agriculture and product around the state. I mean, it's real statewide, not just here in the metro, but it's a big problem in the metro, and, and the in intersections are hugely, and roads are hugely expensive. So I'm just gonna be quite honest with you. I, uh, um, I was there when we voted for the last tax increase on, uh, um, on the fuel, and that was, uh, I think, in 2005. We overrode a veto of the governor, uh, my hockey buddy, T. Paw, Tim Pawlenty, and uh, um, so. But you know, with some help of the Republicans, and but you know, it's really hard. What's happening is, and, and it's just really hard to have an honest discussion because it takes money. It's not just to, in, uh, to invest in this. It's hugely expensive uh, per mile, and uh, and. So we've been really fighting. Um, there's some great things that are going on in the East Metro in the next couple of years, right down the road from where uh, she lives and then kind of between our houses on Hadley. Uh, Senator Weger and I were able to get $10 million along with the state to help with the feds to get Hadley intersection done. If you look on 36, you know, I'm kind of proud we've been able to uh, fix a lot of the, you know, English 61 on 35. So I, you know, we've been fighting, trying to do a good, you know, a strong fight for these metro, but it's gonna take money. Um, and that's the bottom line. It's, it's tougher now that gas is climbing, quite honestly. And I totally was in favor of a blank on and off kind of scenario. You know, I mean, there is kind of a flinch for everybody to get to the $3 mark and like, if it's 297, do you wanna pay 302? Because the gas tax, of course, no one's gonna want to. But it was $2, if it was five cents, people would probably wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't mind it, but it's a, uh, it's a problem we need to, it's gonna take money, I hate to say it. Thank you. So Rachel Buckles, same question, what are your priorities for uh, infrastructure maintenance in the state? Sure, so a really great example of bipartisan work. Um, Representative Karen Clark actually presented a bill to the Agriculture Finance Committee. And um, she really got in the weeds on exactly how, but you take soybeans and some of the byproduct from soybeans you can actually use to create a sealant over asphalt to try to help um, prolong the longevity of asphalt roads so that way they're not breaking down quite as much. And so it was a pilot, she wanted appropriations uh, from AURI from a, a research grant um, in, to test this and some streets in Minneapolis to see if this is a viable option. And I thought that was a great idea because it helps make our roads and bridges last longer. They're using asphalt. You're raising a commodity for an agriculture product here in the state that we are very well known for and we export you know billions of dollars worth and i just kind of thought this is a way that really would bring greater minnesota and metro minnesota together for a common cause and it's something that republicans and democrats can do because we're both we both have a common goal of making sure that our infrastructure is safe and sound problem is that you know you say it takes money and I say well yes everything takes money but how do we best invest that money to make sure that we get the best bang for our buck back and so I was really appreciative to see that there were some initiatives um, for you know other things more than just build more roads build more roads and fix it and think that that's okay that there's new technologies that we can use in order to make our money last a little bit longer on our roads. Thank you. 
So the next question will go back to you, Rachel Buckles. And I picked this question because I don't know what this is. I had to look it up on my phone. So I'm going to read the definition because I figure everybody should know what it is. I, I, I just learned something, lifelong learner. So apparently there's concerns about the legislature passing its preemption laws. And apparently preemption is the purchase of goods or shares by one person or party before the opportunity is offered to others. So I just learned something. So what is your position on preemption laws? Rachel Buckus. All right. Um, what was the definition for that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's why I looked it up. My, my, under, my understanding, and please correct me if this is uh, not quite right, but my interpretation of that is so if you have a product and you offer it to somebody else before you offer it on the free market, that I don't know. I, I'll read the definition because I, this is new to me. The purchase of goods or shares by one person or party before the opportunity is offered to others. Oh, so would it be more so for research? That, you know, I would have kind of a... Do you want me to answer that first? Yes, that might do. help you. <laughs> okay. That would be great. Thank you. So, it, thank you. And then, then you'll, you'll have a good answer. <laughs> um, Preemption is uh, what happened uh, in, in some of the cities around the state. Now have, uh, they've started some smoking bans or they've started uh, um, maybe a livable little, little wage. So um, uh, her party is, or you know, the Republicans have uh, decided that they, they want to stop preemption. They, uh, they want to decide uh, for all jurisdictions around the state what is best for them. So me as a policymaker, and, I, I started on a city council and uh, I kind of go back to that. I, you know, I think actually being on some of these local things is actually harder than what we do. It's uh, certainly the school board and the city council. It's my, the smoke blowing and the former mayor, Cardinal, he would appreciate this as well. Um, it's, I think it's harder than what we do sometimes. And they are closer to the local jurisdiction and I think they have a, a maybe a better sense than even we do sometimes. So I would support uh, uh, the local policymakers making decisions that uh, that and even if I don't necessarily agree with them um, I think they have to face their voters and they know what they need one of the things that I've always hated and it's drive, drives me absolutely crazy is that like school boards have to go to that, <laughs> that they have to uh, vote to uh, approve a levy and and they know what they need they know what our local kids need and I would trust our local schools Nancy Livingston here in this case and the others to make good decisions. That would be my my preference. So I uh, I I think I helped you a little. Yes, you did. <laughs> it wasn't research. So anyways, I, you know, I'll leave it Th that. Thank you very much. So Rachel, we're back to you. Okay. Uh, appreciate that. Sometimes when you're hiding out in the agriculture committee, um, some of these other things are. Um, uh, so I would say that. For the most part, I would absolutely believe um, in local control. I think that the small, the closer to the problem, usually the solution is closer to the problem. So if you have issues that are happening, um, you know, here in Maplewood, we would ask, you know, Mayor Slawick to go ahead and try to find ways to address it, and we would bring in community leaders to address the problem rather than, you know, truck all the way to St. Well, I guess trucking to St. Paul is not too far for us here, but you don't really need the state to go ahead and fix some of those problems. Sometimes, though, I would also say that there could be unintended consequences that happen with preemption. So when you're talking about, um, you know, when you say liv livable wage, I think that also kind of goes hand in hand with the $50 an hour minimum wage. Um, you know, here in the Twin Cities where the cost of living is exorbitant, um, $15 an hour is something that you probably do need to make in order to get by. Where you're living, you know, from where my husband is from, if you make $15 an hour, that's actually a pretty decent wage because cost of living is much lower. Housing is much lower. Um, you know, food prices can be a little bit lower too. And so when we talk about maybe a person working at City Hall um, as a clerk or secretary or something and they make, you know, that $15 an hour minimum, if that's, that works great for them, but now somebody that's from Round Lake you know, maybe they might be drawn to move to the Twin Cities where you're going to make more money than staying in some of these towns that are completely dying off. So 
I absolutely support the idea, but sometimes I'm concerned that it could have unintended consequences. And so I'd really like to, I don't want to get into the weeds, but sometimes I think you might have to get into the weeds to make sure that you're not having unintended consequences for the rest of the state. Thank you very much. So with this question, we will start with Leon Lilly, and I've kind of rephrased it, so hopefully this reads well since I just did it on the fly. So what can the Minnesota State Legislature do to improve the retention of current businesses in Minnesota and attract other businesses to our state? So as it stands now, um, Minnesota is uh, one of the top nations in the country for uh, per uh, having the top 500 companies. So we have about 17, 18 companies right now, a 3M right down the road here, and we're lucky to have them, um, I think. My son's a chemist, so maybe I'm a little biased. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, a per million people. So it's it's kind of a funky little formula. And I think, just to give you an idea, our neighbor to the, to the east is like 20th, 21st in the country. Um, with the top 500 companies, so we're um, so we're lucky to have them too. So it's always a balancing act with uh, trying to maintain these. I in my other life, I mentioned earlier, I worked for Delta Airlines. Well, they used to be Northwest. Well, we were bought by a company that's from Atlanta. So the likelihood that they're going to move the corporate headquarters from Atlanta to Minnesota, you know, which we heard in the press, was pretty unlikely. You know, I mean, just in all honesty. I mean, we love Minnesota, and, you know, despite the snow and you know all these things and the potholes. But you know, it's a it's a wonderful state, but it's unlikely that an Atlanta company is going to move to Minnesota. So the most likely scenarios for these big companies and other companies to to uh, to build them from within, and we do a great job of that. And I feel kind of proud of the things that I did as a legislator this year was with the capital investment committee that I serve on. We made investments at the University of Minnesota. Um, and continue. A lot of it's granted boring stuff. It's just fixing the roofs, but some of it's uh, like Century College, $6 million right here, and they're doing great things with the Fab Lab, and it's building ideas, and I think that's our future, is coming up with ways to, to build from within, and it may not be the Amazon that picks Minnesota, but quite honestly, take a look at it. They don't necessarily treat all their employees that well, so... I mean, by building within these tech jobs, solar and others, we can, they make on average $70,000 a year. So, thank you. Thank you. So, Rachel Buckle, same question. How can the legislature improve the retention of current businesses and attract other businesses to the state? So, well, I know my dad back there really appreciates, you know, um, bonding for the U to fix the roofs and things like that as he works there. Um, I would say that we have amazing schools. We have beautiful countryside. Um, I, I cannot ever get enough of the North Shore. Um, going up to Two Harbors is like my happy place. Um, the thing though that really holds us back, in my opinion, is our taxes. So I have a really good friend who uh, is from California and she's a geologist and she works for oil companies. And her and her husband moved to Idaho where, oh my goodness, the amount of money that she was paying as opposed to living in Idaho, lots. Um, she was actually talking about possibly moving to the Twin Cities. And she said that it would be great to live here in Minnesota because you know they visited and they love the state, but she doesn't exactly miss the amount of money that they pay in taxes. She says it's kind of nice to be able to put away money and go on vacations and things like that. Another thing, um, Another example I have about taxes is so um, my husband's dad worked for a company, well does still work for a company called Worthington Egg Prints. By the name you can tell that they used to be headquartered in Worthington, Minnesota. Well, they, uh, they also had headquarters, or they had their corporate offices over in Maple Grove. Well, a couple years ago, they went over to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. They built a completely new facility. They obviously moving out there costs money. Within just a couple short years, all the money that it costs for them to move, they've saved on taxes that they are no longer paying here in Minnesota. So I think we really, really need to take a look at, I understand that we things cost money, and I understand that you know people, we do have things that we have to pay for as a government, but sometimes you have to wonder where is the line drawn. 
Thank you very much. So this next question, we start with Rachel Buckles. So we know that the state passes a bonding bill. And so do you, uh, the, uh, the question is, uh, is a, um, I guess, is there a, a size limit? You know, is the sky the limit? Do you, how would you decide how uh, what the so size of the bonding bill? So um, I know the bonding bill this last year, I believe the House proposed 825, and then the Senate wanted 1.5 billion. Um, and so we kind of came to a consensus there on our bonding bill. Um, there's absolutely things that we need to address with our infrastructure. We need to make sure that we have clean water. We need to make sure that um, you know our wastewater facilities are taken care of. So there's absolutely things that need to be taken care of and addressed and paid for. Um, I would say, however, that we need to stop looking at our budget, and this includes the bonding bill. We need to stop looking at this as an unlimited credit card, and we need to start paying attention to our state spending the same way that all of us in this room pay attention to our budget. And in my opinion, um, some of us pay more attention to our budget than others, because um, they have kids that play hockey. Um, but I think we need to pay more attention to how we're spending our money and not exactly take taxpayers for granted. So I would say that I have a limit when it comes to our bonding bill spending, but I definitely appreciated uh, the 825 million versus the higher uh, price tag that the Senate proposed. Thank you. So Leah Lilly, same question. How do you decide the size of the bonding bill? So many of you probably don't know the bonding bill is a little different than other legislation. It, it needs a super majority. So it's a bit of a, uh, a bit of a mess to put together. It takes, you know, it's not just having the majority and you need people from both sides of the aisle, you need, uh, you need buy-in from uh, people and uh, common interest to pass a bill that's in the, the betterment of Minnesota. So Minnesota, again, a lot of people don't know, probably are, uh, not to pat our own backs, but we're, and Senator Weger is here, and um, in these last couple of years, we've achieved a AAA bonding rating. And what does that mean? You can borrow money that's really cheap. So it's like you, if you've got a high credit, you know, uh, mayor, former mayor uh, Cardinal, you sell real estate. So people show up and they uh, they want to buy a house. If they got a really good credit rating, they can probably buy it a lot easier and get a better rate. And that's the same with the state. And we don't usually talk about that. So according by the budget analysis, we can afford um, to carry a debt of $3 billion. And there's always been kind of this billion dollar threshold. Now keep in mind, we went over in these last two years, we had a close to it or above the billion dollars. But what happened is we didn't have a bill for the two years before us, so we're playing catch up. So the, so the roof that your dad was working underneath or in the facility year after year, we haven't been fixing them because you know they've been patching leaks and moving buckets around. And so because we didn't, we didn't pass a bill. So now we're trying to catch up on that. And then there's roads, a lot of this goes to the roads that you were saying earlier, all over the state. So it's not exciting things, but um, I wish I had more time because um, there's a lot of good things that we've been able to do around this area with the Representative Slavic when she was in Weeger with the, the Tubman said the East Metro, the, I mean, we just train fire training center. We've been able to do great things with Century Fab Lab. There's just some great things that we've been able to do for this area and, and uh, fight for, and I'm pretty proud of it. Thank you. So uh, if, if our timer is ready, I would like to just do a one minute question just to break up the pace a little bit. You know, I like to do this, my favorite question actually to ask the candidate for us. So uh, we'll start with Leon Lilly. What is your favorite thing about living in District 43B? So I, I actually really like the people. I, uh, I, I specifically asked for Friday nights off so I can go down to the car show. We had a festival up by uh, Silver Lake. Uh, I, I like to go to the community events and, uh, you know, and I'm sure, you know, just, I, we've been really blessed with good people that care about it. And uh, I've been honored to serve this area and I get people that'll, you know, that are a lot more conservative than you and they'll smack me around, but they'll vote for me because they know me for, you know, some time and, Anyways, uh, I just love the people of this area, and I'm I'm really honored to serve, and I mean that sincerely. And humbled, you know, every time, you know, just to be able to do it. It's just 
It's just an honor. Thank you. Rachel Buckle, same question. What is your favorite thing about living in District 43B? You know, so my dad and my stepmom moved here when I was nine years old. And Oakdale, um, you're in North St. Paul, I'm in Oakdale. <laughs> Oakdale has always been home. Um, it's always been the, I know we're in the city, but it's the town that I always come home to that has always meant so much to me. It's always had so many just amazing memories. Um, you know, I lived, I also grew up in Marshall, Minnesota with my mom and my stepdad. And I had a lot of great memories there too, but I mean, I, I got to Tartan and I was a kind of a country bumpkin, and I had so many amazing friends right off the bat. And it's, it is the people here. Um, this is home, and this is always going to be home. And I'm so blessed to live here, and I'm so blessed to call this area home. Thank you very much. So the next question, we'll start with Rachel Buckles. And I have several questions kind of on the general uh, theme, uh, basically of early child education and pre-kindergarten programs and do you think the funds the state funds should be used to expand accessibility to pre-kindergarten programs as well as funding early childhood family education so I think that parents are the ultimate advocates for our children um, I think that when we want to adjust the achievement gap I think that when we have universal pre-k that's not that's for every kid so we're talking about some of the kids that are from multi-millionaire families do they really need the state to be paying for their <coughs> universal preschool when we've got kids right here at um you know at castle at cowern at richardson that are struggling and their parents probably can't afford for them to go to preschool I really want to see scholarships. I really want to see parents have the ability to choose where they're going to be sending their children, especially in those very early years. Um, as far as childcare, um, I talk very, you know, my childcare provider and I are very close. Her name is Katie, and she's not all that much older than I, and we went to high school together. And she really struggles dealing with DHS and some of the things that they really, really nitpick at. And I don't know if you listen to, um, the hearing, but there is a very, very passionate woman who actually was cited by DHS for her daycare because her grass was too prickly. Just let that sink in. Her grass, it wasn't that there was weeds, it's just that the grass was dry and it was prickly. And so that was when DHS decided to show up and cite her for having prickly grass. And so I think we also need to really kind of loosen up a little bit. We need to make sure that we're upholding the standards that really matter for our children's safety and easing up on some of the things that are kind of weird. Um, but again, um, early learning scholarships so parents have the choice to choose where they're going to send their children to and making sure that we are supporting our daycare providers and not making their job any harder than it already is. Thank you. So we on Lily, same question. Uh, should state funds be used to expand accessibility to pre-kindergarten programs and supporting early childhood family education? So, um, you know, our school district, again, some folks probably don't know, but they were leaders um, by doing all day, uh, uh, all day kindergarten. Um, and then with Representative then and uh, well, both of you, Senator Weger as chair of education and Orla Slavic as chair of the early childhood um, caucus and uh, committee, um, were able to bring uh, all day K statewide. And uh, I mean, it's just uh, the return on the dollar is just amazing with this stuff. And I don't, I, I, I wish I knew it, but I think it's sixteen dollars to one dollar. So if you invest one dollar in early childhood opportunities. Um, the return on your investment is 16. Now, I wish I could do that with all my money as I'm aging here, getting closer to retirement. And, um, but uh, um, we as a state need to really pay attention. And I think I mentioned that earlier um, with my comments with our, uh, our, our community of diversity. Um, we need to make sure that our kids are hitting the ground running. And especially our kids that uh, maybe don't have the opportunities that some of us had as kids. Um, we want to make sure that they're up and running and ready for school and the, it's just, it sh propels them way ahead in the long run. And so as far as the state, um, I just, I believe the investment is uh, worthwhile and sure there's going to be some people that uh, have great homes and great uh, parents, maybe have an education background, 
that can help uh, educate the one kid. But overall, as a society, we got to think as a state legislator. We got to think bigger. We can't think of you know individual families, unfortunately. But we got to think of the whole community. And our community is complicated. And to to really be successful, we need to make sure that all our kids are successful on a path to succeed. And by having education, we can do that. Thank you. So next question, Leon Lilly. So uh, there are people who feel that new federal regulations are putting our uh, air and clean water at risk. Uh, what should the state legislature be doing to increase protection for our state's uh, natural resources? Um, so I, uh, I guess I'm kind of got to toot my own horn. <laughs> kind of, I've been honored to serve on a legacy committee. And uh, many of you might not know what that is. It's a committee a few years ago that uh, uh, spends money in these areas that taxpayers approved a few years ago. It's by when we went to the ballot, and three eighths of one uh, one percent goes into a fund, and much of that goes to outdoor hunting and fishing and uh, investments in that. And Speaker Dowd appointed me, and on Thursday and Friday I'm going to be working on about 118 million dollar uh, bill for the next year and investments in that. And then uh, there's arts and cultural heritage, and then uh, um, so anyways, parks and trails. And then there's a big component. One third of the money goes to clean water. So and uh, it's vitally important. I mean, when you think of Minnesota, um, what do you think of? I mean, uh, obviously the state fair just got done. So you, two million of you thought about that, of course, and the corn dogs, but it's uh, and cheese curds or whatever your favorite thing is, but. Um, clean water is really what it is. If you remember those ads a couple years ago where the girl was out on the dock skipping a rock or, I mean, if you can't eat the fish right here at Phelan or, you know, over in Silver Lake or Keller, I mean, it's pretty sad when you think about it. And that's, we're pretty lucky. In greater Minnesota, it's even worse. Um, if you look at the maps, if you look at the aerial map of the Minnesota River, the water is just I mean, it's just full of uh, runoff and different things. So Governor Dayton is really led, and I've supported him along the way in, in working with uh, farmers and others to, to work on some of the buffers and uh, uh, cleaning up some of that water around the state. And there's a lot of, uh, there's all sorts of things that are attacking them. So I don't know as much about air, but um, quite honestly, I know there's efforts that are in that area, but I could speak for a long time on water. So. <laughs> Thank you. Rachel Buckle, same question. Uh, what should the state legislature do to protect Minnesota's natural resources? So I uh, met with some ag groups on Sunday at the fair. Um, I met with milk producers, I met with pork producers, and you know, so many of those groups, I know, I think here in the metro, we always tend to think that farmers aren't you know, taking care of our water as well as they should be, but truly they are. There's been so many advances in water treatment that's going on in our agriculture um, that I don't think it's talked about enough. And so I really want to make sure that we support that. Um, I know that I think there was about 90, well over 90% compliance for buffers with a lot of our farmers. And it's really just a few that are just kind of being a stick in the mud about buffers. Um, I think too that some of the holdup is um, some of the things that came out with Bowser uh, Board of Soil and Water where there was some pretty excessive fines that they would be hefting on farmers that were not compliant. Um, I think one of them was even if you are just a few feet out of compliance, rather than fining you for those few feet that were not in compliance, they would fine you for the entire parcel. And in some instances, that parcel of land, especially if you've got a creek running through on both sides, or the creek is running directly in the middle of your parcel, you're gonna be paying for that entire parcel double because you're paying on both sides of that uh, creek. And so, you know, there's things like that that we really need to address, and I'm glad that we did at the legislature. We addressed um, Bowser trying to, you know, unilaterally make that decision. Um, so I think if we try to listen to all these other groups that are trying to do the right thing and realize that not all of us have the same enemies that we think we do, um, and we work together to create um, water quality and water plans that are unique to every region of our state. I think that's where we're going to see a lot more consensus and I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the problems kind of decrease with our water quality issues. Thank you. Next question will start with Rachel Buckles. There are a couple of questions here on this same topic and so I will just pick 
one as just kind of an example of uh, this issue. Do you support background checks before a person can buy a gun or rifle in the state of Minnesota? Why or why not? So this is funny. My husband and I actually had this debate at the state fair booth. That was a question um, that was on the uh, House information ballot. And um, I think that there is a lot of common sense that we should be applying to our guns. But I think that some of the legislation that came out um, this last biennium was really restrictive. Um, so for example, my husband, um, he owns shotguns. I personally do not, but my husband and I both like to go deer hunting. So when we go hunting, I will use one of his shotguns. Well, the question is, how far do these background checks need to go? Does my husband need to run a background check on me, his wife, to borrow his shotgun when we go hunting together? I'm in the military, or I was in the military. Um, I've taken firearm safety. I'm, we're very responsible gun owners. Um, so does he need to provide or do a background check on me to borrow his shotgun to go hunting? So I think we kind of need to draw a line on what is common sense, which you go to Cabela's and you buy a gun. You know, I think that um, overwhelmingly the state has kind of said that that's what they'd like to see. Um, but I think when we start talking about private transactions, that can get pretty broad and pretty vague. And so I think when you're talking about transactions between family members, I think that's not exactly necessary. Um, if you're talking about you're just selling to somebody on eBay, well, maybe that's a little something that you might want to double check on before you might become liable. Um, so I think that there is some consensus that we can build on, but I also think that we need to be very careful that we're not infringing on Second Amendment rights either. Thank you. Leo Lilly, same question. Uh, do you support background checks before a person can buy a gun or rifle in the state of Minnesota, and why or why not? There's a couple things that happen at the legislature that the, the public sometimes doesn't see is that sometimes bills don't get hearings. And uh, so it was, it's a bit frustrating to me because I think, uh, I think uh, you send us, you know, whether you win or I win, they'll send us to vote. And uh, so one of the things that happens is uh, bills won't get hearings. And, uh, and that, that happened, uh, there was kind of a situation where they uh, kind of forced the chair to have a hearing and then they had a hearing and then, so, but there is some really uh, extreme, I think in many senses, like ban all guns bills and, you know, obviously those aren't gonna go anywhere in all reality. And then there's common sense stuff that makes sense to, that I think everybody would get behind. Um, certainly background checks make sense to me. I I just don't really see a big problem with that. And then, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I would imagine it's the same for everybody. We all know somebody in our life that probably shouldn't have a gun. You know, somebody that might have some mental health issues or someone that has a, 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 a bad point in their life or I don't, you know, but really the, you know, the people that, you know, that have clearly shown that they're uh, hostile. Um, I think, you know, to me, I would be comfortable with somehow, you know, having a check in on that. So it, it gets tricky as far as how far you go, but um, I, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, with having some some book at. Um, and I think it's pretty clear. And if you really look at your own lives, you all know somebody that probably shouldn't have a gun, whether they're. You know, if they're going through a, a really bad divorce and they've just, uh, both couples have been fighting or, you know, anyways, I can think of a hundred scenarios. So anyways, that's, that's my answer. Thank you. So Leon Lilly, yeah. uh, still with you. Um, so we all have read a lot about uh, immigration policies that have been in the news uh, recently. Um, the, sh the question is, should Minnesota allow sanctuary cities and sanctuary churches? And if you, yes or no, why or well, why not? <laughs> yes, I think we should. Um, I, uh, you know, the. I think we've recently found that uh, there's many people. Uh, I don't know if you get an opportunity to read. I grew up in a newspaper family, so I read papers all over. There's some great articles of what's going on in Iowa right now, and a lot of people are. Uh, um, that are visiting Iowa, and I'm sure it's the same in Worthington, because I've, I've talked to her boss from Worthington, I've talked to uh, <laughs> one of her bosses, 
Um, <laughs> right? Is that Hamilton side your boss? Okay, uh, your teammate. <laughs> okay, not boss. I don't know why you would. Sorry, I didn't mean to insult you. Okay. Um, <laughs> thought we were partners. So, uh, that you work for. Okay. So, anyways, uh, um, they have uh, many folks that are in town that are working at different places, and obviously someone's hiring them. Someone's putting them to work. I mean, they're not just showing up because of the weather. I mean, think about it. It's going to be snowing here soon, and if you're from um, South America, you're probably not going to choose Minnesota unless there's a job or some opportunity. So I, I think that uh, we need to um, uh, allow different jurisdictions I, I, you know, to make their choices on this, and they can uh, decide. I, uh, I'm, again, I, I think that uh, we should have ways that people can get into the country through a structured way, and uh, I hope we can figure that all out. Uh, in a peaceful, uh, respectful manner. And, uh, so. Thank you. Uh, to Rachel Buckles, same question. Should Minnesota allow sanctuary cities and sanctuary churches? Why or why not? So uh, that would be a yes and a no, or I guess a no and a yes. Um, cities fall under the jurisdiction of the law, and so do churches to an extent, but just as I am very hesitant to have the church try to uh, bring more and more law into the government, I would also be very hesitant to try to put more oversight on churches. So if that's what churches want to do, then that's what churches want to do. Um, as far as cities go, I think that we start to kind of run into some problems that might, again, have unintended consequences. Of course, there are, I think for every one bad person who comes to America for nefarious reasons, um, you know, drug cartels and things like that. There's probably dozens more families that are truly trying to escape a lot of the poverty um, that's going on and just so many of the bad things that are going on um, in South America, especially in Venezuela. Um, so I would, I know that there's a lot of good people that are truly trying to seek a better life. My concern is though, Minnesota is kind of on the list of hubs for human trafficking, specifically St. Cloud. Um, during the Super Bowl, there was a lot of concern about um, exponential increasing in human trafficking. Um, we also have uh, I-35 and uh, 94 that are also corridors for drug trafficking. And so I think we, of course, we want to be fair to families that are just trying to do the right thing and for whatever reason are having a tough time with that because I know our immigration system is kind of a mess. But I am also concerned about people that might be taking advantage of that and could be harming our kids, our family members in the process. Thank you. So we're back to you, Rachel Buckles, on the next question. Um, there. Uh, there are surveys about what voters in general care about, and apparently Minnesota voters care about uh, campaign finance laws. So do you support uh, changes to cam campaign finances, finance in the state of Minnesota? Um, I would propose there to be um, as much transparency as possible, um, not just to voters, but I think also to donors. Um, you know, this is my first time ever running a campaign. And so I think about all the people that have donated to my campaign, um, and I see a few of them in the room here. And uh, it, I'm always very conscious of making sure that I spend that money as best as I can because it's not mine. It's money that people are putting behind me to support me. And so I think that having more transparency in our campaign finance laws would be a good thing for not just people that are you know nitpicking at your campaign because you know probably people that look at your campaign and go, oh, Lily, what did you spend your money on? But we also need to look at our donors, too, to make sure that their money is going to what their candidate said it would go to. Um, I also know the headache that our treasurers um, for our campaigns um, go through as well. And so I'm sure if we could try to streamline some of that process, that would work out quite nicely for some of the behind the scenes folks on our campaigns. Um, I can't really think of a whole lot else except for just much more transparency. Thank you. Leon Lily, same question. 
Uh, do you support uh, changes to campaign finance laws in the state of Minnesota? Well, I, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think campaigns are pretty, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, like at our level, are pretty straightforward. It's, it's somewhat what happens is the outside groups get a little, uh, um, and you're not really sure where that's coming from. So with the Supreme Court decision, like everybody else, I was probably paying attention to Dorothy Shoes and the Supreme Court today and the big state fair numbers when they came in the record setting. So, but the Supreme Court uh, made that decision a few years ago that we can, you know, that, you know, that money can be spent and we don't necessarily know who it is. So I don't know how, I don't know what we can do as a state necessarily myself. I, um, maybe there's something, but I, uh, I think what I find is, you know, many of the races and uh, ours has been blessed so far that we haven't had any of that on either side that I'm aware of. Plus, you've gotten some mail that I haven't seen yet, but uh, um, you know it's usually pretty straightforward. So it'll be a debate of her ideas versus mine at this point, and then but some races on and both sides of the aisle are honestly guilty of it, um, and uh, um, we'll do it uh, and say stuff and um, about each side, and it comes from a mystery party that you never know who it is. So it is frustrating. It's uh, I didn't see the timer, so I'm probably done, but um, I. Uh, I think elections that I've seen are pretty uh, pretty clean and straightforward, but um, I believe our, if you've heard what's gonna happen with the statewide races, and I mean the media buys have been huge, and we're just gonna get inundated here real quick for the next 60 days. It's just gonna be crazy land on, on our TVs with all the governor races and the uh, Senate races and the, all the statewide and on. Uh, so. It's going to be, and we're not going to come look at the very end, and you're not going to know who they're coming from, some of it. Thank you. So, Leon Lilly, next question is for you. 32% uh, of the children in Minnesota live in low income or poverty family situations, and what role should the state play in helping these children get their families? So, um, you know, uh, many of our kids are really, truly struggling, and um, um, and our neighbors right here in I want to say River City right here in our neighborhood but it's uh, um, my folks are over here and we debated it today about how many kids are uh, couch surfing so and I think one said 17% and 16% was the other I think or something and they I don't think they, they agreed to disagree at the end but nonetheless the the point is that just think about that as uh, how many kids don't know where they're gonna spend the night so that's part of the reason I like being on capital investment. We made some investments in housing um, for folks. And think about that as a, a barometer. And then you think about food, that a lot of kids that don't have food security. And how, how are they gonna come in and learn? How are you? And if you don't have health care, So that's why I'm a, I guess, that's why I'm for universal health care. I just really believe that you should have health care. You should have housing. You should have food. And if you don't have those, um, I don't know how you're gonna, it just makes it hard to succeed. Yes, there's gonna be some kids that punch their way through and we'll hear about them, the Michael Jordans, and, you know, I can't think of an academic one, but you know, that'll rise to the top and be the champion of the world. But a lot of kids, the Joe average, you know, or Jane average person is gonna, you know, have a hard time, so. Thank you. Rachel Buckle, same question. 32% of the children in Minnesota live in poverty or low income family situations. What role should the state play in helping these children and their families? Um, strengthening parents, really. Um, I was that teen mom that was struggling to make ends meet. I was that teen mom that made sure that my child ate and I missed a meal or five. I was that mom that was literally counting out my pennies to pay for diapers. So. I know firsthand how tough it is, and I can't imagine being a child. I mean, I at least had the opportunity of being 18 and getting a job. I can't imagine what it would be like to be, you know, my son's age and couch surfing, and not old, not even old enough to get a legal job. And so, I think what we need to do is strengthen our families and our parents, and if our parents are the reason why our children are couch surfing, then we as a community need to come together because the last thing that child needs 
is to get lost in a statewide system. What that child needs is to have stability and to have structure and to have a community that's supporting them because at the end of the day, you can give a child all the food in the world, you can give them the best clothes, you can give them a mansion, but unless that child has the stability and the love of a parent or a close adult to help guide them, it means nothing. I mean, how many spoiled, entitled brats do we see that are very wealthy? You need the love and consistency of an adult, and in a lot of cases, our parents, but if our parents are lacking in that department, then as a community, as family members, as church members, as activists, come together again at the local level and keep that child in the community and not let them get lost in the system. Um, is what I would say. As a state legislator, I think just supporting initiatives like that. And that's where, um, you know, if I'm elected or if you're re-elected, where we don't address this at St. Paul, but we use our um, connections that we have in the community and bridge them together with other um, leaders as well to make sure that these children are taken care of and stay as close to home as possible. Thank you very much. So the next question, we're, we're back to Rach Buckles. And there's a whole bunch of questions all relating to our public schools. We know that the state provides a good uh, amount of our public school funding. So what are your thoughts on public school funding, uh, setting budgets, schools meeting the, uh, um, the achievement gap, the so general kind of your support of our public schools in the state of Minnesota? In only two minutes. Um, so I, I'm so happy with the work that ISD 622 has done. I look at the progress that my children have made and it is just phenomenal. Um, you know, my oldest son is in accelerated programs and he is taking math that I struggle with as an adult. Um, <laughs> my middle son, um, you know, his teachers are working with him constantly to make sure that he is safe and comfortable and um, just enjoying class and I mean my kid went to school today feeling like he was walking into prison and he came home and he was pretty bouncy and talking about how great of a day he had today. So um, I think that is a direct reflection on the amazing work that teachers over at Castle do. Um, as far as what we do with our state budget, um, almost half of our state budget goes to education and as a parent I'm perfectly okay with that. I think what we need to do is make sure that our dollars are going into supporting our teachers so that they can teach. It's not going into, um, you know, to waste. It's not going to things that you're not really going to get a good return on. Um, I want to see our tax dollars go back into our classrooms so that our teachers don't have to spend their own paychecks on school supplies. I don't want to see teachers that are living paycheck to paycheck, sometimes getting second jobs, third jobs, like what's going on down in Oklahoma. I don't want to see that happen here in Minnesota. But we also need to make sure that all that money that we're spending, because as a state, we've agreed that, you know, a bulk of our budget is going to go to education. We need to make sure that we're spending those dollars as best as we can and that they're going as close to the children as possible. Thank you. And then Lily, same question your views on support of public education in the state of Minnesota. I'm actually really proud to be endorsed by the, uh, the Teachers of Minnesota, Education Minnesota. I, uh, I, uh, it's actually something I'm very proud of and I'll say it publicly and I, uh, I support, uh, I've said it multiple times in my discussion items here to this evening, how important I feel the work is that our educators are doing with our kids and what that means to uh, uh, Minnesota being as great as we are and uh, make sure that we're all of that in the future. I, I if anything, I just uh, I just believe it more every day as I serve and then when you get in the community, um, you really see it I and mean, the, the challenge that's before us, um, I think the 28% statewide of kids are uh, free or reduced or is it 30, 20, I think it's 28% of our kids. So one third of our kids are on free or reduced uh, meals every day. Um, I mean, just kind of gives an idea of what what their home life might be like and, it, you know, uh, and what the challenges might be there. Just that alone, much less uh, uh, mental health issues that kids are challenged with nowadays or uh, just on and on and on. So I, uh, I, I very much support 
Uh, I check in with our local school board here. Um, I've been really blessed to have uh, people before me, Senator Weger and Norris Slavic, that have uh, lifted me up and taught me that since day one. And I have, if you win, I, I'm going to be telling you how important the schools are in this area and how important they are uh, to, to our area in a matter of pride that uh, I, I think, and it just beyond that in the state, when you tour around the state like I have and you get an opportunity to go into these other schools and you go into Hibbing and you see the amazing uh, school that they have up there or just uh, all over the state of Minnesota and it's just, and the, the opportunities that education can give to a, a person to lift them up. I just really, I believe that more now than ever. Thank you very much. So we're going to do our last question before we get to closing statements. We're going to start with Leon Lilly, and we're going to give them a minute. And so... <laughs> I'm watching her. Okay. So tell us about a book you're reading. Uh, so I'm, I'm reading, a, ironically, I had a book stolen yesterday. <laughs> I'm reading a Grisham book. And it was at the airport, and I had it sitting on the ground, and someone took it. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's what uh, what I was just reading, and uh, um, I love Grisham stories, and uh, I uh, the Dan Brown books I enjoy. I love I love to read. I as a legislator, and uh, with our campaign life, you really don't get much of a chance to read. But uh, um, I I really enjoy reading. Don't tell my father that, but uh, I didn't do as well in school. I should have read then, but uh, I love reading now. Thank you. So Rachel Buckles, tell us about a book you're reading. So um, yeah, it's been crazy. I still work full time, still take care of the kiddos and doing this. Um, so what I like to, when things get really chaotic and hectic and I feel you know, just really anxious and overwhelmed, the series that I always, always, always go back to is Harry Potter. <laughs> um, and it was great because my daughter, I don't know if she's still in here, but today um, she sported a Hufflepuff t-shirt. So she's a, she's a very, very avid, oh yeah, first day of school Hufflepuff. My, actually, my other son is wearing a Harry Potter shirt too. So um, yeah, I always just kind of go back to, you know, it, as the series goes on, it progressively gets more complex. And every single time I reread re the series for probably the 29th billionth time, there's always just a different theme and a different facet to it that I find. And you know, you could read the book over and over and over, all the books over again, and it's always just a little bit different. So I know that sounds a little juvenile that it's Harry Potter, but that's that's always my go-to. Thank you very much. <laughs> so in closing, I apologize if your question was not asked, and we got to a, quite a lot of issues, I think, but there's always more. Uh, in a limited form such as this, and we can tell they're kind of sagging. We probably should be handing out cookies. So uh, if you have questions that weren't answered, we uh, encourage you to speak to the candidates at the close of the forum or, of course, in the days up to the election. So we're going to do our closing statements in the reverse order from the opening statements. And so remember, you have two minutes for your closing remarks. And so uh, in reverse order, that means Ali and Lily, you're first. Um, first off, I want to say again, thank you for the league uh, for doing this, and it's, uh, I really think it's a neat opportunity and um, that we can do this in this country in this, these times to have a, a discussion, a, a debate of ideas, and uh, thank you for that forum and keeping it peaceful and uh, respectful, and, and hats off to Rachel for that as well. Um, uh, Again, thank you. It's, it's been an honor to serve this area. I really am humbled by this, and it's a privilege to church to serve this area, North St. Paul, Maple, and Oakdale. And uh, I didn't mention stuff in Oakdale, but I love your summer fast. <laughs> and your, um, and Senator Weger and I got uh, the trail, a new bridge that goes through your park right there. Uh, anyways, we can go on. But it's, uh, you know, uh, it's just a really a neat community that uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I happen to talk to former uh, Cardinal here. It's not in my district, but I'm gonna go to his booyah um, at his church. They got one of the best booyahs. I recommend that you go to it, but it's just, you know, I just really enjoy this uh, this area. I'm proud to be, I take the part of representative um, pretty serious. I try to represent. I know I, it's impossible to represent every voter. You know, some people are t totally gonna disagree, but. I really do try to listen and hear you out. I'm not the best campaigner, so Rachel's got a chance. But uh, I, uh, 
Um, but I try to take the job very seriously and I do, a, I think, a good job. I work very well across both sides of the aisle. And again, I try not to punch the other side in the nose. And I have good relationships with uh, leaders that I think can uh, uh, help us succeed. Senator Weger and I have some agenda items that we're working already on for next session. Um, and, uh, you know, again, thank you for coming out on a horribly rainy day and post uh, uh, cheese curds and all that stuff. I saw some of you at the fair, but I just, uh, it's an honor to serve uh, the state of Minnesota in this area. Thank you very much. And so we are now ready for Rachel Buckle's closing statement. Again, you have two minutes. So um, when I, it wasn't a rebuttal that I was going to make. I was just going to say um, some of the legislators, when I said that I was running against you, they're like, aw, but I like him. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, you gotta kind of disagree on some things. Um, so I do really appreciate the the opportunity that I have to campaign and to meet you know so many different people um, in the city. Um, you know, I I went to Tartan, so I it's kind of ingrained in me to have that you know rivalry with North St. Paul. <laughs> My children play hockey with Tartan. Um, but you know, and I'll, it, it's been a really wonderful experience to just you know go all across the district and meet so many new people. Um, you know, people like Dallas and people like Andrew um, that I never would have met if it wasn't for campaigning. Um, and so it's been a, it's been a real blessing, and it's uh, it's also been really it's been really nice to kind of campaign against you because again, I'm not interested in mudslinging. I'm not interested in you know beating up on all the things that I think have gone wrong. It's we could focus on that or we could focus on moving forward. And that's what my intention is if I'm elected, is to just leave the past in the past and just move forward and just work on what are, the, what are our common goals? How can we achieve our common goals? What do we have differences? And how can we find a common ground to bridge the gap with those differences? Um, and uh, that being said, I also want to thank everyone in the audience for uh, listening to me babble along. This is my very first time speaking in public. So <laughs> I'm really glad that nobody booed me out of here. There's no tomatoes thrown quite yet. So um, I really want to thank everybody's patience. And again, thank uh, League of Women Voters for hosting this forum and for giving us this opportunity to share our ideas. Thank you both. So thank you. And I'd like to remind the audience that the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters and sponsorship of the forum is not an endorsement by the lead for any candidate. I'd like to thank the candidates and the live Hi. and TV audience. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, um, I would like to acknowledge and thank the candidates who are serving their community by their willingness to participate in the democratic process by running for office. I would also like to thank the audience here at the candidate forum at home for taking their time out of, I know everybody's very busy schedule, to watch the candidates discuss issues that are important to, to you and your community. Again, this forum was aired in its entirety and will, will be replayed on Comcast Channel 16, as well as on Facebook and on the web portal. So please check your cable channel for those airing times. So remember, every vote does count. This year, Election Day is Tuesday, November 6th. The polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., so you should be able to get there. So please remember to take a friend and a neighbor and vote on Tuesday, November 6th. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>